Hi. Um, it's so great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, I've been listening to such amazing talks all day. I feel like there's so much more, so many more questions and things I want to talk about than I have time to today. But um, I'm excited for the discussion afterwards as well. So hi, I'm a marine ecologist, um, but open data science and the communities and tools in this room and beyond have been so game changing for my science and for my life. And that is not an overstatement. Um, I have gone, I've been so empowered by these tools that I've sort of been moving away from conducting my, my own research towards enabling other people to do their research better. Um, so as a marine ecologist, I am, I am a, in a, my, I am an environmental scientist. So we're the geneticists, the biologists, the physiologists, the climate scientists, all of these different people who are studying the natural environment and how people interact with it, like the food systems uh, that we have, sustainability, all these different things. That United Nations report that came out this week about the million species that are gonna be extinct, that is scientists like me that are doing those, that work. Um, so we have different backgrounds, different study systems, but we are united by the fact that we are never trained to work with data. We are never taught how to use a computer. And it, yeah, it's, it's like that awkward, terrified laugh. <laughs> um, because we're working with really important global systems and the, the um, practices that go on in our labs, like there's kind of this sense of like eyes down, elbows out a little bit um, when it comes to working with data and with um, practices because we don't have a culture of sharing. We don't have, um, we just don't have like the, um, the mindsets that we can do better some, t some, some of these times. So groups like our open side, the Carpentries, our studio, all these groups have enabled me to see that there's better ways to do things and to learn from these communities. And I really want to bring these, to th these practices to environmental science. Um, so to put this a little bit more, uh, uh, to, to go through this a little bit more, I like to use Star Wars analogies. So um, this is Luke Skywalker sitting on the edge of the Dagobah swamp after he's crashed his plane. He is sitting there super demoralized looking at a problem he cannot solve with the skill sets he has. <laughs> That, that's, that was me. That is so many environmental scientists sitting there looking at their data, not knowing how to tackle it. And, and what will happen is some pretty messy, pretty irreproducible uh, approaches to tackling this problem with the skill sets we have. But there is a different way to solve that problem. Um, here's Yoda coming along and solving this problem in a way that Luke never dreamed was possible. And Luke is gonna be able to learn from Yoda and he will be able to solve this problem himself. And he will go on to tackle problems that are much bigger and broader in scope because it, it's, it's gonna broaden his imagination of the things he can take on. So this is what open data science does for scientists like me. It is just game changing. It is so empowering and it's, uh, yeah, it'll take you places you never dreamed. Um, but something that's also really important is that it's not just the tools and it's not just um, the Jedis. It is this whole community of people towards this bigger movement. Um, and there are such different backgrounds and skill sets and we can all come together to work on something bigger. So this is the way I feel in the open data science universe. And I want ecologists and climate scientists and all these other amazing scientists to feel part of this bigger movement. So I love Star Wars analogies and I'll come back to them, don't worry. But um, we've, also, we've also published uh, scientific research about this story, about how these tools and these communities have made us do better science in less time and have much bigger impact. So I wanna talk about two examples of environmental open data science communities that I've been a part of and been leading um, for the past, um, the Ocean Health Index has been for the past six years and OpenScapes is a program I started in January as a Mozilla Fellow. Um, so the Ocean Health Index is this big project to help bring more data and science into policy, ocean policy on the ground around the world. So we developed a scientific framework uh, published in 2012 and, and then also assessed how healthy oceans are for every country that has a coastline globally. 
And we've now been repeating this every single year. And this data-driven assessment with 100 different public data sets modeled with, um, with management targets and a bunch of different, um, a lot of more backstory than, than that, um, is now being used by the United Nations uh, because it is this transparent, reproducible way of using data to assess oceans. So it's been really, it's a really awesome project, um, and we've also been able to enable other countries around the world to use our methods as well. But what I want to talk about in the context of the Ocean Health Index is how open data science has helped us work as a team and kind of kick that um, feeling that many scientists have, even within a lab, of not having community and not being able to talk about data and, and struggle solely with their data cha challenges and have basically everybody um, just feeling stranded the way Luke did. Um, but we all feel, we work like a team, we have overlapping skill sets, and what it's done is that we've been able to, each year, take less time to do these repeated assessments that we have to do every year. Um, and it's, and it has, so, that, so yeah, the circles uh, show the amount of time relatively. But it, it's also let us focus more on training other people and enabling other people and building community around these tools. So, um, we, we lead these global assessments, like I said, but we also enable uh, teams around the world to do this as well. So I, over the last six years, have led this program where we've helped governments around the world. This is uh, Colombia and Indonesia. We also have groups in uh, the Baltic Sea and in Norway and in Canada and Samoa who are using not only our science, but our our open source tools in order to get better data and decision making into the oceans. Um, so this is a busy slide and I'll walk us through it. We're going to start up in the top left and come around um, counterclockwise because um, I'm tr I just want you to know how much open data science has contributed to this effort and made this possible, like made it possible so that small team of us um, right here um, has been able to help 20 countries around the world and do these assessments every year. So I was hired in 2013 to teach our science to governments and groups that were interested in using our, our science. And so I was able to work with my team to contribute to our global assessments and start a program that will enable other governments. Um, I pretty quickly in 2014 needed to learn R and I was thankfully able to join our studio and our open sci communities rather than struggling with um, as I had as a graduate student when I was trying to learn MATLAB by myself. Um, so learning R with these communities enabled me to help us develop our, our software toolbox, like as we call it, our R packages and GitHub workflows um, that then I would teach the, these scientists around the world. Um, so that was great. So I'd started off trying to teach the science, and then now I was teaching the science and our coding packages, which were awesome. But then I realized I needed to actually teach people how to use R and GitHub beforehand. So that's when uh, I became a carpentries instructor and started teaching software carpentry um, workshops, and uh, I started co-started a. Um, a study group locally at UC Santa Barbara where we Skillshare um, and teach each other different things. We started off teaching each other GitHub and then spatial data analysis with R and all these kinds of things. Um, so that really equipped me to be a better teacher to my Ocean Health Index community so that I could teach them R and GitHub. But um, then I really realized that the problem um, that I faced within these communities wasn't that they didn't know how to use R and GitHub, it's that they didn't even have the mindset to want to learn them. They didn't even have this like team mindset or, or team culture or individual mindset that would enable that. So that's when we led our nature paper, nature ecology and evolution paper, and started an R ladies chapter locally um, in order to to sort of welcome more people into this world um, and, and broaden beyond just ocean um, oriented groups. So trying to reach broader environmental data science communities. And then this has also led to this Mozilla Fellowship that I am super lucky to, to have and be a part of. Um, and I've been able to lead OpenScapes, which is this effort that I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about, um, which I'm super excited to tell you about as well. So the questions that kind of spawned OpenScapes 
are um, how do we welcome more people into this world and empower them with the existing communities and tools that already exist? Um, and how do we focus, for me, on environmental scientists, but actually do this more, much more broadly? And then how do we also, in order to do this, I think we really need to think about helping science labs work more like teams. Okay, so this is OpenScapes. Um, so the, what I'm trying to do with OpenScapes is to complement existing efforts and welcome more people to this world. And in doing so, I wanna increase the visibility and value of open data science within the environmental communities. And I wanna do, excuse me, do that by amplifying awesome scientists that are now using these practices. So I want everybody to feel like this. <laughs> um, well, that's not, well. It's a team effort, but I just love this uh, graphic. Um, <laughs> um, so with OpenScapes, I have started this Champions program, which is a mentorship program to make more champions for open data science in our communities. And I'm focusing on early career scientists and their labs. So scientists like me, who are now tenured faculty and are doomed to, to have a closed mindset and a closed lab if, unless they're welcomed into this world because they've never been exposed to it otherwise. So I really wanna normalize open data science in the lab and then help seed it far beyond. So um, it's, this is a five month remote program I'm des developing or, or have developed um, in the vein and modeled after Mozilla Open Leaders. So that means that it's all done remotely through Zoom, which also means we can have smaller breakout groups and have people discuss things as smaller groups as well as the whole community. Um, and there's kind of two halves of the, um, of the curriculum, the first being about lab culture and lab mindset, and the second half really being about skill building with the broader community on campus. Um, and so it's all about kind of welcoming people to these tools and practices and communities that exist. And I'm developing it to be um, discipline agnostic. I should say too, I, I have plans for uh, beyond this uh, pilot cohort that I've created. Um, but I, am, I have been testing this with it, it's either the inaugural cohort or the pilot cohort, but I, I do plan to um, continue this effort beyond this first cohort. Um, so I'm developing all of this with these seven champions in their labs. So I've got 24 people that join me twice a month to talk about open data science and what's, how they can uh, get this into their lab culture. So these are my seven uh, champions. They are all incredibly awesome environmental scientists who I've chosen for three reasons. Um, the first is that they are already rising star early career faculty and lecturers. They have incredible momentum and they're doing really important science and I can help them do better and help them be an ambassador for open data science as they continue to rise, which, I am, which is really exciting. Um, the second reason I chose them is because they are not involved in open data science yet. They are either unaware, hesitant, or, or not, not bought into open science. Um, so it's a tough crowd. <laughs> but um, the reason I picked them, the third reason was trust. Um, these are all very close friends of mine from graduate school or currently at UCSB. And they were willing to, to participate in my program that they didn't know what it was because they saw that it was important to me and they knew that this would be something bigger. So that trust is something that we can talk about with scaling as well. But um, what I think was cool, and, and two of them actually said, you know, I don't know if this is gonna be useful for me at all, but I'll join because you're asking me to. <laughs> and then they are like some of the biggest advocates, which is yeah. amazing. And that's what, exactly what I want. Um, and so, and then this is our, this is um, most of us on one of the cohort calls. So these are all of those seven champions plus their labs together. And I teach them together and it's, it's hard and there's challenges, but um, I do it for, again, three reasons. Um, the first is so that everybody, PIs and lab members together can value this, can see this, can know it's important and value it. And then the PIs, the principal investigators can, um, they can uh, be an ambassador for it in their bigger channels on campus and beyond, and they can enable their lab to do it. 
and then their lab has agency to do it and they have support from their PI, but it kind of removes this feeling that the PI needs to be an expert in it first in order to enable their lab, which is a big hurdle. Um, okay, so there's been uh, some really awesome outcomes um, in the four months already. Um, and I am excited to talk to more people about how to quantify this and how to track this either now and, and also beyond. But I'll show you what I've come up with so far. Um, everybody has, every lab has a GitHub organization for the lab. And that's a big deal um, to have everybody having an accounts and being able to participate somewhere. And then that there's this idea of longevity of the lab. Um, they have codes of conduct. They have protocol, protocols for digital onboarding into the lab. Um, they have data, man some of them have data management um, protocols. So it's, it's been really awesome to see that they are really putting this forward and saying like, we do this, this is important, this is the type of lab we are, this is the type of culture we are, which is really exciting. Um, another, their homework each week is to normalize talking about data science in the lab. So instead of this kind of eyes down, I'm working on my own science and I am unique to everyone else in the lab, I want them to see those horizontal cross-cutting similarities across the lab. Everybody has to send data or figures to, the, to your, your PI. How do you do it? Do you email your Dropbox, your Google Drive? Like, let's have a, let's have a system um, and it will make everybody's life easier and then we can figure out how to onboard new people into the system. We have undergrads every, every summer. How do we onboard them? Like that kind of stuff. So they not only are having these chats every week, but they are now starting to amplify that they're doing it. So these are examples of um, places online you can see that. They're also joining and leading communities um, outside of the lab. So they're participating in, um, well, they're, they're creating coding clubs on campus and they're joining existing ones. And they're also starting new Our Ladies chapters and, and really trying to figure out how to move forward in the community. Um, and they're also being ambassadors more broadly. They're tweeting to their environmental science communities about R and about code packages they didn't know exist and about the feeling of how awesome this is. And, uh, and just, you know, trying to, you know, they're, they're, they are saying for themselves what I want them to feel, which is amazing. Um, not in such a heavy handed way that that just sounded. Um, <laughs> Um, and something that's also been great is um, there's, there's some real tangible sci scientific collaborations that have come out of this already. People are writing a grant together about aquaculture, both um, from a bunch of different angles. And it's just really exciting that they're within the realms of what is um, what they are measured upon within their scientific um, structure, they are still having um, really support, uh, good wins that way as well. Um, there are so many other things I would love to say. There's so many little wins of little efficiencies, time, um, mindset, all these awesome things that I um, am also trying to track. Um, I'll just wrap up with a couple challenges from this. Um, this first one is, you know, I didn't really expect that labs didn't by default think like a team. And um, even though I had experienced that in my own PhD lab, um, I had kind of, you know, with rose tinted glasses forgotten. So I, I really had to reframe my curriculum to really on the first half focus on just the idea that we're a team. Um, imposter syndrome and hierarchy are real things. Um, early career faculty have so many pressures on them and they are trying to be leaders b both in with their peers and with their students and it is a big deal for them to say I don't know how to use GitHub to their students, you know, and, and they shouldn't, and they feel this like burden that they need to learn it in order to have their lab do it. So this is something that I'm trying to do is like kind of break this hierarchy and, and, and name that imposter syndrome. Um, and then limited time prioritizing and no in, uh, academic incentives um, across the board is really hard as well. But um, 
I think some ideas that come up with this are that I think a lot about how open software and open communities really create a kinder culture in real life as well. And like we see that here at this conference, like how do we channel this back to the labs and to science more broadly? So I think about that a lot. I'd love to talk about that. Um, and I also think we need to invest in people that are making this culture change and, and, ha and value them. And the way you value people is by giving them job security in academia. That would be amazing if not, if there are more people that wanted to support this with teaching and doing um, more, st adding more stability to labs, we're able to, to do that. Um, so this brings just me back to the whole idea that this is a part of a bigger movement and it's really exciting to have more scientists feel a part of this movement and I'm really excited to, to be here and be a part of it with you. So thanks everybody.